Uh, I think the mics are all good. Wow, there's so many of you. And you're all looking at me, it's weird. Uh, no, thank you all so much. Welcome to another and the first of this year of Steve Association Melbourne chapter, which you're all part of. So well done on, on joining us. Uh, if it's your first time here, really appreciate you guys coming down. Tell your friends, come to more. If you're a veteran, great to see your faces again. Uh, we're going to start off with a welcome to country. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today is a special one because uh, we've got a new, let me just move that so you can see all, and maybe you guys can't see it there, but you can see the sponsors at the bottom, so not centralised, which is the group I'm from. My name is Mark, by the way, or Captain DeFi on Twitter. Corny name, but it's great. Sensen, thank you to our Sensen sponsors who are here. Uh, raise your hand if you're from Sensen. There's a few. Uh, raise your hand, come on, come on. Okay, thank you to Sensen. Sewn and Chalk, uh, they are in Melbourne, but uh, they're our sponsor, mainly up in Sydney. Adiubo Legal, they do a lot of stuff in the smart contract space. Uh, block owner, I don't think we've got any block owner here. Fireblocks, where are my Fireblocks people? There we go. Fireblocks are awesome infrastructure in the space. We'll hear from Amy uh, later on, so welcome to our new sponsor there. So what we're going to do today, I mean, hey, you've got to get the, you know, the Discord, the Twitter, like get your phones out, get the QR code. There's a, a few links there, or if you don't want to do that, defi.org.au. Easy to remember, mostly. Um, and there's a whole heap of uh, links there to the Discord, the Twitter, YouTube page, the blog. Um, you can see our sponsors all up there as well. Uh, and we'll put that up later on. Today we're going to talk about, actually we'll go through the highlights and then the agenda. Um, we're slowly growing again. There was a bit of a hit, something happened, something called FTX, you know, and a lot of people left uh, the market late last year. Um, but still we keep on bringing on the builders and stuff. Uh, we were able to launch with Stone and Chalk a partnership across Melbourne, City and Adelaide, something called the Web3 Innovation Centre. So if people are working in this space, there's nothing worse than you, you go home or you go to a WeWork or nothing against WeWorks, but you're not connected necessarily to other Web3 people. Well, Stone and Chalk wants to change that and I'm sure we're gonna get others doing it. We've got it with Upside Down, you know, people that are sitting in spaces that are all working in Web3 on something or other. So Stone and Chalk is working with us to do that. Token mapping, thank you to everyone who was part of the community who uh, submitted their, their responses. I had to read through all of them and then use ChatGPT to figure out what the common responses were and the differences. Like, it's it's so much work and stuff, but uh, it was great. We're submitting that midnight tonight, depending on how much I drink. Um, the RBA, we'll talk about that. The CBDC projects, a lot of wholesale use cases there, um, a lot of examples, and we'll talk about that later. And then some real world crypto. So a restaurant, bar, just like this, is using NFTs as memberships in Sydney. I, I know that there's a place, um, I think it's in Port Melbourne or something like that, that's doing it here as well, but we're gonna start seeing more of those activations. So look out for that. Uh, on the agenda, so welcome country, we've done bad, Oz DeFi updates. We'll talk about Web3 infrastructure with Amy from Fireblocks. Uh, Olga over here, we're gonna talk about marketing. NFT trademarks, a Hermes victory. So we'll figure out what is going on there. And uh, I think you brought a Hermes bag, Amina, no? Not, okay, not today. Okay, the real life example is coming later. Updates, blockchain in the real world, I'll talk about that. And um, clearly I was still getting the slides ready this morning, so there's nothing there on that last one. Um, audience questions. And I'm getting hit on the Discord, that's great. Uh, five blocks, let's get Gimme up. Woo! Where are you gonna sit? We're going to be this far apart because we're decentralized. Ah, is it? No, 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 guys, no, 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 no. Friends, is that working? I'm not blue. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's okay. All right. So I guess first of all, can we... On the camera? Yeah. Where's, where's the... Are we, are we good? Yeah, we should be good. Um, so let's talk about the stuff that's on here. So with National Australia Bank, uh, big announcement. It was in the AFR. Yeah. You might have heard of the AFR. Cointelegraph, uh, some other Web3 publications about a cross-border payment. And there's some other use cases too on the next page. Maybe we just, actually, we'll, we'll go to that next one. Because you guys are doing a few things and people may not have heard of Firebox and now you get to change that. 
But what was the cross-border payment with that? And yeah. yeah. Maybe we can start by asking around the room. Anybody heard of Firefox besides the people that's here? So we got some folks. Um, I think to summarize what we do really simply, we provide wallet infrastructure from your larger banks that you will see here, all the way down to your Web3 startup uh, development firms that are looking to build new use cases. And then where we provide a lot of value is the security aspect of it, but also around control, around uh, operational excellence, uh, around API integrations, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a bit about us. In terms of what we did for NAV, um, like you mentioned, it is a stable coin use case with a focus around cross-border payments. Now, NAV has tons of, um, I guess, sub-banks under their umbrella where they are now helping, you know, large MNC businesses to process their cross-border payments. Prior to this, they would have used SWIFT as uh, effectively the network that allows them to send um, dollars to one another. Um, they figured it was a good way to look at blockchain technology to help improve cost is one aspect of it. And then also speed is probably the more important factor because SWIFT ultimately is a very archaic, takes a long time to process payments even within subsidiaries that NAV owns. So they're looking to achieve, uh, at least start to achieve with these type of cross-border uh, cross initiatives is to find ways to help you know the large multinational companies of the world that they serve as clients um, to process their cross-border payments in a much faster, uh, more efficient way. Fantastic, I mean, blockchain has a lot of power here, folks, and you know the core tenets of what it's good for: efficiency of payment, transparency. That's weird. Wait, wait, Mike, um, it's it's really good to see that kind of stuff. Not just that Nav, you know, just recently announced they're doing stablecoin, and then this like so soon. But the 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 wave of corporate adoption, I feel, is going to come as the next Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, they. I think if you look at blockchain as a piece of technology from a high level perspective, it sounds like no brainer. Um, I think the challenge ultimately from a bank's perspective is how do I get risk to sign off? How do I get the regulators to sign off? How do I apply the same controls that they do today around who can do X, Y, Z and apply it into a bearer instruments like assets that could be issued on top of a blockchain and effectively making sure that, you know, the, the hacking risk that we see in the crypto market does not penetrate to a large institutional bank. Uh, and where we help them to do that is use the Firebox solution to allow them to execute on all of those requirements as a whole. Speaking of banks, and we'll get back to the use cases, but um, people might have noticed something happened over the weekend yeah. with all the banks starting with the letter S. Mm -hmm. uh, pattern, I don't know. Um, but, you know, people have spoke about how, how could blockchain have helped in that situation? Are there things that if we were using blockchain rails, it could have helped? Do you have uh, some thoughts on that? The reason why I'm pausing to answer that question is because the cause of what happened in the US really mismanagement uh, of, of risk ultimately. So I believe that if there come a time where a bank could tokenize all of their securities and these assets live and could be trackable, could be transparent on the blockchain, then yeah, it's very difficult for a large institutional bank to potentially use accounting rules to you know shovel some parts of their book into somewhere else. We don't have to report day to day. Uh, so the transparency aspect definitely is there to help protect um, you know folks to to get there, right? And I think second thing I would argue is if you look at why we're all here, a lot of the mantra of decentralized assets in the first place. The question becomes like, why are we even leaving money at a bank in the first place? So you could go back to why Bitcoin and why Ethereum, why all of those good things that started a lot of while we're here today and make that argument as well. And we you know, hear both sides of those coins. And I think um, in the US at the moment, you know, with what's happening in the market and the various different risk management, um, I think, yeah, like there's a lot of reason why people want to be blockchain. And I think that will come in the next few years. So I think those experiments, I mean, it's integral to have the infrastructure for people to do those experiments. A beautiful thing about blockchain is it's this big open source global experiment mm -hmm. and having tools out there that people don't just have to start from scratch. They can see what others have done. They can fork a project. They can do all of that and test in real time very fast. I think it's powerful. Let's get back to the use cases. But 
what happened with uh, ANZ? What did you guys do? Um, this was actually our first uh, bank client here in Australia. Um, and they launched a more of a stable coin focus domestically, right? Servicing their largest clients that they've had over, you know, close to, I would say, 100 years um, to help provide them and use stable coins as a medium of transfer to help settle a securities instrument. And one of the things I think us and Anne that when we met first, we were like, you know, if you believe the future where everything will be tokenized, you gotta solve the money problem first. Because if you don't solve that first, no matter what security to tokenize, you're still gonna be done on T plus two, T plus three settlement. And their first point to tackle was the money side. Let's tokenize all the dollars. And then since then, we worked with them on other use cases, right? We just did one around carbon credits. And obviously they're a part of now the RBA project to do a bunch of other use cases as well, which we'll support them on. But really, I think even though the two use cases are similar in a sense where they're both tokenizing money, but I think the ultimate use case and ultimate benefit uh, benefiter of these, which is the end clients, may see in a very different kind of way. One is cross border, another one is just a medium and more efficient settlement for um, various different financial instruments. I think it's beautiful that we're, we're seeing, you know, that the government here is actually being open to experiments. It's not just forcefully here, you have to use this now. Like, let's actually experiment, let's get feedback and let's see what happens first. And I think they've got four out of the 14 use cases. So they're not doing too bad today. Nope, up. they're like winning the Oscars, you know, just <laughs> sweeping them up. Absolutely. Uh, and let's talk about the, the third use case, digital government bonds. Yeah, so I mean, the other one that we see quite often as a security that does get tokenized is the fixed income market and the bond market. Um, the reason why that is, I think equities market is relatively new and they're pretty good tech already in existence to manage settlements of equities, but bond market usually is very archaic and in an example of you know Telegraph stock exchange they want to be able to offer you know on exchange trading for fixed income products and getting these assets tokenized to allow them to sell that more efficiently is really one of the uh reasons why they want to do this and around the issuance side of things right if you look at how much time and cost it takes for a call it a, a traditional exchange to list product to trade on the venue um, the reason why they don't do it for every single product is because of the cost that it takes. Reducing that process, reducing the cost that it takes will enable them to get involved in maybe smaller cap assets, uh, maybe uh, longer duration, more illiquid assets as an example. Uh, and hopefully that will allow them to have more opportunities to offer to their clients to trade. I think it's brilliant because like, it's not just lowering barriers of entry for all of us, the citizens, maybe not working corporates to participate. But it's also for the corporates that maybe wouldn't do certain things because it's just too costly. If we lower those costs, what are those innovation possibilities? So that's great. We've, we've got a few more use cases. Let's go through those. Yeah, so I mean, on this slide, we actually switch gears a little bit away from banks on the other side of the spectrum that maybe folks in the room might be interested in. Um, the, the first one really is around, um, actually all kind of token NFT use cases. So Flipkart is a uh, Indian company. They are the Amazon of India. They have a huge e-commerce business and they came to us with the goal of building a platform to help loyalty, right? They want to build a loyalty platform. They want to start airdropping various different NFTs that represents the membership to their uh, users. And that's what they use us to help build. The platform is called Firedrops, unrelated to Fireblocks whatsoever but um, they're doing that today. So if you think about what they're doing is really for uh, mobile sales, right? They wanna get better managed by demand, maximizing differences. And really this is one example of working with an e-commerce company, think about Web3 as a beginning, as they think about how do I engage my users, how to get more sales on the back of that, as size their loyalty and build an ecosystem on the back of this. The second one, which again, you guys may not know the name, but it's a very popular Japanese anime and a game. And actually we're seeing in Japan, because they have such huge IPs in terms of media, in terms of music and you know, anime and, and gaming, right? They're very on the forefront of doing various different Web3 initiatives. So this example, they are turning their Web2 game into a Web3 game with various different in-game economics to incentivize users to, to buy various different digital collectibles and the benefit there for them was I would say you know it, it, it's I mean the idea for a lot of them in the end is uh, the ability for them to cross pollinate with other platforms down the road right so getting IP value capturing those IP values and building new functionalities that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to do um, previously in your games is kind of what we help them to do um, 
And the final piece, I believe Sensen is actually here, so I will let them talk about what they do later, but it's carbon credits. This is a, uh, a huge movement, I would say, when it comes to tokenization. Twofold, generally speaking, carbon credit is a very new product within a financial institution. It doesn't come with tons of legacy debt, which means that legacy technology debt, I should say, which means you can build very cool technology on top to allow you to extract the value you get with blockchain plus carbon credits. Um, you know, and also all of these in terms of tokenizing money, tokenizing carbon credit, tokenizing NFTs and things and collectibles. From a Firefox perspective, we just get them a set of technology to allow them to do this at scale with high security and so that the, um, the end user who may not be from a blockchain background are feeling confident they can issue these projects uh, without diluting the risk. I love that. And you know, people are going to be in the future using pools that are just paying them faster or using payment systems that are very transparent if you're in construction or if you're a contractor and you can see with your whatever tool that the other side has the funds and if they don't, well, you just don't do the work, right? Yeah. I mean, but, also, yeah. I think what we're seeing with kind of going mainstream and getting folks to use these products is the reality is that end users actually don't really care what technology you use. Right, and then they, they just care about the results, which is, is it faster, is it cheaper, is it more secure, is it more transparent? Uh, how we actually achieve that for them, at least from a user adoption perspective, you know, they leave it to either ourselves or you know, the platform themselves to deliver that solution for them. Um, and we spend less time trying to discuss with them nowadays about you know, how all of these magic sauce works, but more about what it can do for them and the end users. And I think that is a real change from a few years back where folks may not have understood the industry, despite all the negative press that you've highlighted, at least it's gotten more people very interested in our industry and it's clicking into how to do X, Y, Z, what is a blockchain? And I feel like we're, I would say, probably more popular than what we were a few years back and really able to, you know, have those more adult conversations with clients now elevating from the very rudimentary ones. I love that. The, you know, those building in the bear market kind of vibes are really important because when everyone's not looking, that's the opportunity to actually build something really cool. And you mentioned with the, the Web3 uh, gaming kind of thing. Yeah. Does any hands up here who is into anime? Anyone? Anyone else? Okay. It's a few. It's good. It's great to, to bring you out. But, um, but you mentioned with the gaming thing, we're seeing things like um, Eat Denver was, I think, last week or the week before, and there was uh, a lot of videos that came out, and here's this really awesome new use case for NFTs, where now NFTs can be transferred, or you can have the one NFT point to multiple types of skins sure. in a game, sure. and those innovations that are there that are going to make all the critics of the space, or Web3 won't work with gaming because of this, well, people are solving for that. Yeah. How, how does that play into what Firebox is doing? Do you guys keep an eye on the innovations or do customers come to you with ideas and then you try to work together to create I mean, something? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to gaming, the big one is CBS, right? Knowing blockchain has limitations around how fast it can sign. So we're constantly looking to new blockchains and new layer twos and improving our technology so that our customers can build infrastructure on top of a blockchain that, of, their, of their choice and achieve the level of scalability that they need to achieve. So from in terms of gaming, that is a big one that we're pushing forward on. Um, the second thing you've highlighted around like various different contract calls and features, right? Like if you want to bake in something a little more exotic in your operations on chain, can your wallet do that from a contract call perspective? Are you able to apply some of the data analytics on the back and to support those engagements. Because at the end of the day, I don't think everything's going to be on the blockchain. It's the reality. You still need the human elements, you need the human control, the human rules to be applied. There's a cost to that as well if you put everything on data. Totally, exactly. So I think those two things we're pushing the envelope a lot forward on. And another one that is happening a lot in the Web3 space is non-custodial wallets. Um, obviously, Firebox is non-custodial wallets. We enable customers to hold their own assets. But as the world moves to more Web3, large brands who previously were Web2 and had a centralized view to maybe their eyeballs, they had your platform, you go on their app, you move to a Web3 world, they're thinking, well, how can I also be a part of the retail wallet aspect of things, right? I don't want to build a wallet, I don't want to become a legend of Trezor tomorrow, but hey, can Fireblast, can you push the envelope a little bit and help us to roll that out that is Let's use an example, uh, you know, Facebook branded wallets that I can then send out to my millions and millions of retail users. I'm not saying Facebook's doing that with us. Use that as an example. 
Um, and that's a lot of the companies talking about Web3 because ultimately, if you believe true Web3, your users will no longer go on email and, and passwords. They will log on with their wallets. And if that is where the information is going to be stored, how can you as a platform also be a part of that as well? And that's a lot of the companies are having with these huge brands now. What are the kinds of uh, services and products? You kind of mentioned some things there, the wallet, like how you help, you know, with the cross-border transfers and sure. stuff. Can we talk about some of the products and services that you provide? Because there might be some builders, I think there are plenty of yeah. builders in the room here, or they might be working somewhere and just have an idea, like, what would you say about, like, what are the things people should think about when they think of Firebox? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost is scalability, right? Firebox is a wallet solution that is fully API integrated. So a lot of the customers that you will see us servicing, um, you don't even know that it's Firebox on the back end that is supporting them through that process. We will, you know, if you go to developer.firebox.com, you can see the full stack is open source. You can look at all those details. Um, so that's part one, I will say, for builders. Uh, part two is security, right? We as a platform, come from the traditional, call it crypto native space where the likes of, you know, uh, 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 BitMEX and uh, Bullish and, you know, Celsius back in the days are using our wallet to manage billions of dollars, right? So today we transfer over $3.5 trillion worth of assets in cryptos. We service on the biggest market maker prop shops in the world today. And, you know, they're using our infrastructure to settle very high value goods at a very rapid pace. So the security aspect is, you know, uh, uh, goes without saying. I think when it comes to builders and a web community, you might feel like, hey, I'm issuing an NFT that's no value today. Why do I care about security? Um, but the reality is these assets will become high value down the road. And you need to think about those infrastructure now. The final piece, and I won't ramble on too much, is, is control, right? Um, the highest risk to any company is not the nefarious attackers in you know, North Korea that's gonna hack your infrastructure. The most common risk we see today is human error. So it's, you're building a wallet infrastructure, you're interacting with these platforms, your team has never dealt with blockchain or blockchain assets before. How do you protect someone randomly sending your assets to a random place? Or how do you protect your internal theft? And, and I would say from a Firebox perspective, um, yes, we always defend against the big bad guys outside, um, but really where our clients love our product for um, is around the internal stuff that allow them to scale, allow them to do the same thing they're used to and not have to deal with a really uh, you know, terrible user experience to scale to their businesses. I think that those user experiences where you copy uh, an OX long chain e alphanumeric address yeah. and you've left off a letter or something, or you've copied the wrong one, because you're doing multiple Sends transactions. Sends the wrong chain, and yeah, all of those, I would say, uh, things that folks who've been in this space for a long time have done before, but probably hate, uh, we try to solve that for them by making that super efficient and super user-friendly. Uh, like, I use our own Firebox wallets through my own crypto, right? And, you know, I don't go and buy this addresses. I connect to my exchange, and then I go send to Binance, and I never have to copy and paste anything. Or if I want to go and send you know, assets to OTC DAS, I go find their name, they're probably a Firebox customer already. So these type of um, what we call Firebox network workflows is for that reason exactly. Um, how do people learn more about it? Like, is there educational type stuff on the website? Is it, do you guys run like podcasts? Are there other, like, what, what can people kind of look for to, to learn more? What's sure. the best way? I mean, the website obviously is a great source. Uh, I've got folks that are here, if you're interested, they're wearing lovely t shirts. And also, the very tall gentleman in the back that's not wearing a t shirt, but he's also Fireblocks. Um, you can ask them any questions. Uh, but also, we run, we just did a lab yesterday, right? So, we will do these hands on labs that get you going from zero to, you know, issue your own token on the blockchain in an hour. So we could, you know, have you set up in our infrastructure, going from register by user all the way to minting a token on the blockchain to a Web3 use case, all within the single workshop. And we do those regularly uh, with our client base. Um, and that's been a quite well received, a hands-on experience that you get to have, because typically Fireblocks is not a free spot that you get to try so. Uh, that's great because you guys have had that live, and so that was in Melbourne, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that here. I knew we do one in Sydney in that tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow as well. Okay, I follow us up the Sydney folks. But, um, you know, they talk about green filling. You know, the, the red pill, green pill, and if you're green filling, you're on board and so on. But you guys are wearing blue, so it should be blue filling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, is there anything else you kind of want to touch on to, to leave people with, you know, uh, if they want to, I mean, just 
really know where to go next because there's been a really confusing kind of time this last couple of months and you know the the hit that we're getting now with the banks and that's all kind of being sorted but what would you give as like a message of hope for people that are interested in working and building in this space um i would say i would say a lot of the technologies that has been built has been validated with crypto first and foremost and even though there's a lot of negativity around centralized businesses we're seeing more folks being interested in utilizing the same sets of technology and to do other use cases that might mitigate a lot of the mistakes folks are made prior, right? If you talk about what FTX has done, it's not really related to crypto whatsoever. It's mismanagement, it's fraud, it's you know, a centralized platform managing decentralized assets, right? And fundamentally, Fireblocks is not a custodian for that exact reason because we don't believe that you should centrally store decentralized assets. I think you should get folks to manage themselves and make that easy. Um, so we're seeing a lot of the trends of you know firms doing that. And if you going back to how we started the conversation with the big banks globally, um, they're all getting involved, right? They probably would not do trading use cases much anymore, i.e. offer Bitcoin trading, but they're all tokenizing something under the hook. Whether they're publicly announcing it or they're doing it behind with various different organizations. From our perspective, it's uh, definitely already a trend that's happening. And another piece I would say uh, in terms of use cases and where things are getting tons of attraction and also uh, investment is the Web3 industry, right? Yes, whilst the centralized platforms and the crypto trading use case have really caught people's eyeballs from a news perspective, but if you look at what's going on with the Web3 community that's been built, um, in Australia especially, um, it's getting a lot of those excitements happening. So my view is, Probably the next bull run will be off the back of Web3. And don't quote me on it, but if it does happen, I think we're all going to be very happy for it. You heard it here, folks. That's a yeah. buy signal if I haven't heard one. <laughs> Whatever you want to buy, you know, just say anyone. Just buy Firebox if you want. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. And if people want to learn more, you've got the put up your hands, Firebox. Blue Where shirts. Guys? Blue shirts. <laughs> and Shane over here, the best dressed giant in the room. Um, thank you so much, Amy. And uh, yeah, we'll speak more. Peace. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Let's see who we got next. Marketing. Where's my favorite marketer? Olga. Where are you? Olga. Olga. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I thought you need a drink. We can go after. We can, we can, no. Come on down. We changed it around, but the microphone's just there. And actually, I'm just going to turn off my sound because you keep hearing my WhatsApp going off. I think that works. Thanks so much, folks. So we've got, uh, we'll do this marketing talk, and then uh, we're going to go through the Hermes case and some other real-world use case stuff, and plenty of networking, right? This is what this space is all about. Like, it's great to hear the talks. It's great that we get to record these and stuff, and we'll put them up on YouTube. Hopefully, uh, you, you guys will get to see that. We've recorded a few other spaces at meetups as well. But let's talk about marketing. It's something that as a startup, you know, going from nine to five to work 24 seven in a startup is great for sleep. Um, but marketing is massively important and people, I guess I never really appreciated it until I had to do it and just figure out how hard it is. But hopefully you're gonna help us dispel some of the myths here. So let's get to it. Uh, marketing the real world. Uh, first of all, tell us a bit about yourself and, and the game. Um, so my company does marketing for tech, for technologies, uh, traditional technology or blockchain technology. And I help companies to build strategies, um, implement different solutions, build campaigns, and uh, just pretty much explain to the audience how they need to talk to the other people. But because what Mark mentioned before, he now he appreciates that the marketing. I've always appreciated marketing. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm sure. yeah, yes. right. So because well, the story is with my background. Uh, I've been working in the technology sector for over ten years, and I know how tech people talk to the audience. So to use this language, that for example, uh, complicated acronyms. Yes. So it's like um, my friend just told me like it's a D in headlights. People react like this, so they don't even really know. So uh, that's why it was focused on problem solving, not technology features. And it relates to blockchain because blockchain is quite newish to uh, different sectors. And you guys know probably blockchain for years and years, but if you go to the real world and start talking to people, they say like, what? 
it's quite complicated. So blockchain solution. So like when you talk to your customers, if you build blockchain solution, you have to be in your customer shoes and understand this. Pretty much the three main concerns they will have it's finance. So blockchain solution is not cheap. So it's not just a simple SaaS subscription when you can pay monthly 40 bucks and you're fine with that. <laughs> so it's quite expensive. Then they will be uh, they will be worried about technology. So do I really need this technology? I'm quite fine. I'm a little bit old schoolish. I'm quite fine with what I'm doing. My database is okay. I'll just My use database. database. Yes, yes, exactly. And then they will go to integration. So this is quite important because it's like, will it work with everything I already have in place? Will it work with, uh, you know, will my team understand that? You know, my stakeholders will understand that. So this is the main uh, concerns that the customers will have. And it leads you to the way you actually speak to your client, the prospect, the, the language you use. So you actually go and explain the, that's the problem solving part and what it can do for you in the future. Not to save money now. Uh, sorry, it's not be cheap, but it will help you to save money in the future. That change is always a little bit, you know, painful whether it's a monetary cost or it's a change in view but in terms of like all of this and it's inevitable like innovation is inevitable that it will push forward how do you kind of uh do you, do you point people towards resources or how do you find ways to break down because it is barriers when it's something new but you know that a business needs it how do you help from the marketing angle kind of break those barriers down? well first of all i would recommend to the company, so I work with B2B, and uh, I would recommend my uh, the developers or the companies develop solutions. So you actually go and try to get to know your clients, what they need to do, and stop hanging out too much with your piece. It's amazing, I love the meetups, don't get me wrong. However, if you are planning to uh, build your customer database, let's say in the health sector, Go and hang out with people that actually working in the health industry. Medtech, just go and get to know what's in the market there and how you can fill this gap. If you don't really know the market, if you don't really know uh, what the gaps are um, and what else you can do, and you're building, you're constantly building something and it's not fit to market, you act, it actually pushes it back because you haven't done your market, like you haven't done your market research, you don't know how it fits with whatever the, the people actually need right now. Okay. And it will push you back and you're just like, oh, for God's sake, I've just built the whole entire solution and nobody needs it. Yes, I would, even if you're building, but in a parallel, I would recommend to do a market research. Talk to your clients, go to talk, but ask your friends, ask your peers, uh, you know, if they have any companies that were probably considering, you know, blockchain, like implementing blockchain solution, talk to them. What's the pain points? You know, what they're trying to solve? Like, what, what's the challenges they have? Because I get lots of messages from um, blockchain developers on the LinkedIn, and they started pitching me. I'm involved in the startup community as well. They started pitching me using emerging technology, cutting edge, game changes. Like, what the fuck this this sounds like a drinking game where every time you hear that on LinkedIn from some random you drink. <laughs> yes, I was like, just explain what you do, not using all these fancy words. Just explain how you're helping other businesses and what your solution can do for different businesses. And you know, I have a really good example of, I've just explored um, IBM Trust Your Supplier, that's a blockchain-based um, solution for procurement supply chain. When you go to the web page, super simple. They use the word blockchain once. Wow. Literally nothing else. They just like access your data, the, the faster uh, onboarding, the suppliers, 
and all that stuff, so they list all that stuff, they, everything. Blockchain was mentioned once. It's, it sounds like a Steve Jobs, you know, not the features, but here's 10,000 songs in your pocket. Beautiful, I'll buy it. Yes, yes, exactly. So they actually go into details with um, like how you can manage your suppliers, how you can build trust without trust, because blockchain will do that for you. But they're not mentioning the blockchain, they actually mention it the problem solving. Trust without trust sounds like my relationships, but anyway. <laughs> that sounds great. I'm like, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, so like if you want to Google it, just have a look uh, for anyone who is um, involved in building a blockchain. Just have a look, trust your supplier. IBM. And this was IBM, yes. And this is a perfect example of how you actually need to, what sort of language you need to use when you talk to clients, because trust me, Lots of people have no idea what you talk about. You all understand. They have no clue. We're, we're a microcosm. Like, there's a lot of this here. This is great, but we are so tiny compared to the outside world. The advantage is that we're ahead of the curve. The disadvantage is, is that trying to help other people understand. Samira's smiling. She knows what this is all about. <laughs> it's not easy, right? So breaking down the language barrier is really key. But you know, still say GM and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, talking to clients. They might not need to hear blockchain, right? They just need to see the, the solutions. No. no, and it's probably if the emerging stuff will is just like, wow, I already had lots of emerging in my life and they're not ready for that. If they're all emerging, are they ever going to be here? I think it's just like, you know, what, okay, emerging and what? And it's not doing anything, it's not solving anything. Being emerging, it doesn't mean that you've been perfect, amazing, and just, you know, relieve my pain. Should be arrived technology, okay. it's not a murder or it's something. We'll figure out another word. We'll do some marketing, we'll do yeah. some market research. Let's jump to this. Um, some simple strategies. What can you tell, tell us about? Yes, this? Uh, it's pretty much that's what you can use for your promotion. And I, well, education work has been overused, I believe, in this community, but it's super important. So when you educate your, uh, whether you work with clients, whether you are uh, trying to um, explain what you do to your community, just education and put it in simple terms. I can't stress you enough how important it is to put it in simple terms. Not everybody understands. If you build and you think it's the language, the only language you can use, that's wrong. So just adapt to whoever you talk to. Collaboration, collaborate with different businesses that what I mentioned before. Go and let other industries know. So health, education, uh, supply chain, whoever you build, and just let them know before you build the whole entire solution. Where is no step back, it's just to rebuild everything, which is, you know, it takes time, money, resources, everything. It's hard if you're stubborn. It's like if I'm driving in the wrong direction, it's like, well, okay, I'm just going to go to this shopping center now instead. But, you know, you doubling back, it's not easy. So starting yeah. early, like, yeah. Yeah, so collaborate with different businesses and industries. And then what communities, I think everybody's doing really great in that area. <laughs> Community, yeah, talk to everyone. Like, if you build for some industries, ask your peers and friends, uh, you know, maybe you know the company exploring blockchain or just considering or like urgently looking for solution. Ask them, you know, it costs nothing to just ask people. And benefits, so this is the way you, you just demonstrate the benefits of the blockchain, just the technology, in, just in general, pretty much. Benefits, not features. Benefits, not features. And, and on communities, the beautiful thing is here, even if you're not working in the space, you're somewhere, you've got a community, you're connected to people. Blockchain tech could affect that. I mean, it's not just blockchain is only finance, blockchain is only art. If you look at the core tenets of blockchain, the speed of transactions, the security, because it's decentralized, it's not a centralized node that can be attacked. Uh, but there's other things, you know, blockchain is not so secure, so I'm not saying it's the most secure, whatever, we can go into that. But transparency is really key. And all these other features, if you look at using those in different industries, no doubt you'll find a way that, of how you can innovate in the space that you're in. So definitely, um, and when you have those ideas, bring them to communities like this. You know, you might not have built anything yet. People are more interested in something when you've just got the idea and they can be onboarded rather than seeing it. 
like finished products are great, especially the tools and the infrastructure like what Firebox has, but I've seen plenty of talks where it's a finished product and there's no opportunity to join. Um, and it's much harder for people to, to really uh, collaborate. Web 2 was very closed off, Web 3 is very open and we, we love that from this space. But how can people find out more about the marketing stuff and the help that you're doing or if they need advice, how do they, I mean from reaching out to you here, but where are you socials wise? Well, I'm really active on LinkedIn, so and you can search my business. It's B dot Jane Begin or Olga Bagnova. So you can search me there. Oh, so, we didn't put the name up. Oops. That's okay. Sorry. I'll find it. Hang on. I'll that's, find the name. <laughs> it's here somewhere. It's in there we go. And it's a go. That is me. And another thing, I actually want to say before I wrap up about um, being in the startup world. And actually talking to clients and people about if you start up with developing, just make sure that the people, industries, will worry about are you going to be here in six months? So if we're buying from you, if we're buying a solution from you, are you going to be here in six months? To so make sure, because we invest lots of money, integration, support, just to make sure that you uh, mitigate this risk and explain risk management will be not Fantastic, people just want to feel safe, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, and please um, thank you, Olga. Let's bring up our uh, next speaker. Where is she? Amina. Come on down. NFT trademarks. Grab the mic. Hello. Oh, is, it, is that working? Can you hear us? Hello. Fantastic. All right. Trademarks and NFTs, and you know some beautiful bags here. Hermes, uh, Hermes, as I used to call it until I knew better and was told off. That's okay. But give us an overview. Like, so a we've got a blog, and this is the latest feature in the blog, as well as like a newsletter and feature there. But uh, what's the overview? Give us the the fifty thousand foot view of this case. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, as Mark mentioned, my name is Amina, and I'm a lawyer at Fainu. Um, so, today I thought it would be helpful to go through some use cases around the world, but especially what's coming out of the US in relation to NFTs and the application of intellectual property in this space. So, I've got two cases that I wanted to run through and look at what's happened there, what's been decided, but also what this means um, to the Australian NFT market and the key kind of takeaways that we can learn from. So for the first case, we've got um, Hermes and um, Mason Rothschild case, um, which was recently decided in the US. So for a bit of background, we have Hermes, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, the major um, fashion luxury label that produces its iconic Birkin bag. Um, Hermes is very well known, obviously, he has a very strong brand awareness in, this, um, in the fashion space. And then you have Mason Rothschild, who was a self described marketing strategist who came out with these meta Birkins, um, which essentially took the style of the Birkin bag but added the fur layer. So <coughs> Hermes has the Birkin name trademarked, um, and when it saw that Rothschild was coming out with these um, NFT collections of their Meta Birkin bag, um, it claimed, among other things, trademark infringement. It claimed that Rothschild was using its Birkin trademark name and the trade dress of its um, bags. So Rothschild, in response, basically claimed that it was just making a commentary on the fashion industry more broadly and wasn't actually trying to breach or infringe on the trademarks of Hermes. So, in the court, uh, there was the issue was kind of distilled into one central question, and that was: Was Rothschild using the um, Meta Birkins as artistic expression, in which case it could be protected under the First Amendment rights, or was this actually commercial speech, where they were relying on misleading customers um, about the origin of the products? Where when people look at the Meta Birkin, they assume that it's actually from the that's behind it, and not that it's originating from Rothschild. So this was put to the court and the jury ultimately decided um, that in favour of Hermes and that Rothschild was infringing on their trademark um, and Hermes was awarded around 300k years um, in damages. So what does this mean in the Australian market? Obviously the law in the US is a little bit different to Australia. 
Um, but for those that don't know, um, a trademark essentially in Australia is a badge of origin. Um, so it's meant to depict where that product is actually from. Um, and when you are filing for a trademark, you register within classes of um, over 40 goods and services. And if someone is using your badge of origin in that same or similar class, that's when you can pursue the trademark infringement. And again, I mentioned that there was this element of misleading conduct here. Um, and in Australia, that would be pursued under the Australian Consumer Law. So where there is misleading um, or a product is likely to mislead or deceive consumers, you can pursue them um, under the ACL. Uh, so if I go to the next slide. Please. Sure. Yep. One sec. So then the second case that I thought would be interesting to consider was the Yuga Labs and uh, the Rick's Rider case, um, which is still being considered uh, in the course. So again, it's based in the US and as an overview of the dispute, Yuga Labs, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with them, very popular on um, Board 8 and the Board 8 Yacht Club, it's very well known, very well, um, there's big awareness in relation to that. Um, Does anyone here have a Board 8? Anyone? No? Okay, just check. <laughs> um, yeah, very well known. So even if you don't know them, you know what they're about and how valuable they are. Um, and Ryder Rich is coming out with these NFTs that we're seeing as kind of copycats of the boarding yacht club. So as a point of comparison, the first one here on the left is Yuga Lud's um, NFT, and the second one over there is Ryder Rich. So very similar. Um, and the image on top with the cap, it's such a Bain C logo one. Um, and so Google Labs looked at that and said, well, you're actually infringing our trademark rights. Um, but the interesting point here that I thought um, is worthy of discussion is that Google Labs didn't actually have um, registered trademarks in relation to the base C and the board A. And so the question was, okay, well, how did they actually enforce their rights to these um, images that they came up with? Um, and they sought to rely on their unregistered common law rights. Um, and essentially, they had applications filed with the court, but they um, were bringing forward evidence to say that even though we don't have these trademarks registered, everyone knows that these are our NFTs, that we've created it, that we have a um, brand behind it. And they're trying to rip it off and profit off of our brand and the reputation that we've built in this space. So in Australia, we have a similar claim that you can pursue, and that's under Class C law. And essentially, if you do want to do that, if you don't have registered trademarks, you have to kind of prove these three elements. So you have to prove that you have a reputation, a goodwill in the space, that there has been misrepresentation, um, that they're essentially taking parts of your product, your brand, um, and misrepresenting that to the consumers, and also that you actually damage, that you suffer damage because of it, or some sort of loss. Um, that they were taking away the consumer that might have been looking to buy a uh, board ape from you and buying it instead from Ryder Riggs, not knowing that it was a copycat version. And again, you can pursue it under Australian consumer laws. So then the question is okay, well, if there are these different ways of enforcing your rights without having a registered trademark, what's actually the benefit? Well, why do I need to have a registered trademark when I'm putting out NFTs, for example? And there are really two answers to that. And the first, it's a lot easier to enforce your rights if you do have a registered trademark. So if you don't, you have to kind of go through this process and prove goodwill, you have to prove misrepresentation, you have to prove your damage. But if you have a trademark, the actual trademark registration does that for you. You just need to show them and say, hey, this is my registered trademark, I operate in this space, they're doing this, and you can go and enforce your rights. So it's a lot easier in that sense to enforce your um, IP. And the second is that trademarks uh, act as a kind of separate asset to your business. So when you have a registered trademark, you can license it, you can sell it, you can buy other people's trademarks. So you can really do a lot more with it as an asset. As opposed to, for example, when it's the Google of your business, you can't actually separate that from your business. You can't license it off and, um, and sell it. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility and a lot more power to kind of enforce your rights. This sounded like really good legal advice right there, but this is not legal advice. This is not legal right. advice, just okay, federal just overview. <laughs> um, but you know what's really interesting, folks, is like uh, in this space, like coming from like a software dev technology background, finance background, I've never worked and been around more law 
than in lawyers that I have here because the space is still being figured out. We've got token mapping consultation that's going on right now. We've got, um, there's going to be another consultation on the centralized exchanges and custodians and stuff coming up. But from your perspective, from the lawyer's perspective, or even just in general, how do people um, wrestle with the idea of like the, the legals and understanding, you know, you see something in the news that's happening overseas, is that going to affect things here? How do people, how would you suggest people try to digest of that and understand it? Apart from coming to our awesome meetups, which is great and listening to you, but what are other ways? Yeah, that's a really good question um, because in the legal side of things, there are a lot of unanswered questions at the moment and that's a problem in, in this space and the exciting part as well, but also um, how is it actually going to be applied legally? So obviously looking to other countries is useful. Um, the US has been first to kind of consider these issues with NFTs and IP. Um, and that might inform how Australian courts, for example, will approach the issue, but not necessarily. Um, so I guess being aware of what's happening and um, I think that kind of the key takeaway um, with the next slide is um, for IP owners, knowing that you can actually enforce your IP rights with NFTs as people who might be buying or selling or creating NFTs, I think it's a bit of a cautionary tale um, to be wary of if you're buying something um, knowing that you might not necessarily get all the IP related to that token um, and being aware that you're not infringing on anyone else's IP. Um, just having it at the back of your mind um, is really important, especially because um, a lot of the NFT platforms, at least some that I kind of read the terms and conditions of, they don't take any responsibility in verifying that. So they might sell an NFT and you might believe that it's you know, the original one with the original copyright, but it might not be. So the onus is kind of on for purchases in that sense. And one kind of interesting point that I wanted to touch on as well was generative AI. Um, just because this, new, this morning we had the news that ChatGPT 4 came out. Um, is anyone using ChatGPT 4? Yeah. Thank you. Great. I'll have to get your thoughts later. Um, but I think that that's also an interesting one. If you are part of the process of creating um, anything created really with these kind of generative AI spaces, um, it's important to kind of be aware of what data you're using. So um, Getty Images recently launched um, litigation in both the US and the UK against Stability AI, um, who they're claiming has used um, their images without any sort of license or without their consent. So um, Get Images has actually licensed their images to other um, generative AI platforms um, and come to agreements with them. But this is another kind of cautionary tale. Be aware of what data you're using and that you're not in the potential breach um, of infringing anyone's copyright or trademarks. Um, and again, just a reminder that while it's useful to look at all these use cases, Every case is divided, they're decided on its merits and on the specific facts. So it's kind of really hard to say that there's a fast and hard rule to how we're going to be enforcing IP rights with NFTs. Um, so, yeah, I hope that was a useful overview of what's been happening in the legal world. And if people want to learn more, I mean, obviously you can chat to you here, but yeah. where can they find you? LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, happy to chat here as well and, yeah, redirect. Freeze that you have with my clients and we've got a great team um, from different practice areas. So yeah, we can help. Fantastic. And uh, at the end of this, I'm going to do some more like just updates. But there are there is a chance for audience questions. So just be thinking about some things. We'll bring the, uh, the the speakers back up. But thank you so much for all the legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, it's important. Oops. Sorry. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, so we. You know, as you guys would have seen the format, it's kind of like networking and then we do some talks and then more networking and that's pretty much it. It's a really simple format. So if anyone else wants to run community events, like feel free. We might even be able to support you as well. So, you know, come chat to us. Updates on blockchain in the real world. And I need a drink for this. So I've been famished. I've been waiting here watching everyone drink and eat. I'm just jealous. One sec. Oh, that feels so good. Um, it's been a long day, folks. I just came in from Sydney this morning. Electra here and I were on a panel together earlier, so that was great. Um, RBA CBDC pilot, New South Wales Government Task Force, Web3 Innovation Centre. I don't know why it's all cut off. There was supposed to be an image there. Crypto little NFTs, let's go. Um, so the RBA had, and you can see there, four of ANZ on their CBAs there. 
MasterCard, uh, the Australian Bond Exchange, Maneuver, someone called uh, Not Centralized with the best logo at the top right there. Um, all of these awesome use cases are testing different ways that CBDCs can be used. Um, there's a wholesale, this is in a big experiment, it's a big sandbox. The beautiful thing about, uh, do I have something on the next? Oh, skipping ahead. The beautiful thing about this is that in this space, you can actually create these experiments and test what works, what doesn't. The government can learn, they can see what's good and bad, instead of just assuming. And if we weren't doing these sandbox, they would just assume, and then make enforcement actions and make rules and legislation. We are doing, not just by telling them what can be done, but by showing them. So I think this is a really good thing. It's gonna run for three months. In the end of May, I think it finishes. By June, we'll have some results coming out. But um, on the RBA page, there is a link to the DFCRC where all the use cases are sitting. You can see what people are doing. Things like GSP automation, cross-border payments, construction payments, which is what we're looking at. There were two more builders that collapsed, I think, late last week or this week. If we had a blockchain where you've got both sides can see transparently if there is funds to pay the subcontractor and if the subcontractor doesn't see collateral, well, they don't do the work. We don't have that wastage. Um, and being able to have controllable payments that are triggered by oracles. There's even people that are looking at how do we use drones to prove that a building has been built up to a certain standard. And if that's the case, it triggers an oracle. So, sorry, I thought I knocked that on um, It triggers an oracle to trigger a payment. These are the things that we can do with blockchain. There's a lot of work to do, but we need to take these steps. And if anyone's interested in learning more, let's let's chat. Uh, the next one. So New South Wales government, not Victorian government, boo, I know. Um, they're doing something, and I want to see other governments do this. So the RBA is doing that really short sandbox. New South Wales is going to do something, but not just for blockchain. We're going to build sandboxes there for data and AI, for digital, which is blockchain, because I don't want to say the B word. That's fine. Um, but the idea is that these task force members, and not centralized as one, along with Google, Amazon, etc., we are going to bring the solution developers. The government's going to bring the data, the problems, the experiments. There's going to be more companies that are, will be able to get involved. But at the very start, we're going to look at, well, what are the things that we could put on blockchain? They're already doing digital IDs. Could there be something that's tied to that with payments? Imagine vouchers, for example. The vouchers that we got from the government during lockdown, so much was wasted and not used. Now imagine that was like on the blockchain and you could see that and you could create some incentives or you could do something, or maybe you could even transfer those if you're not using them. There could be different things that we can experiment and do. Having a sandbox convincing the government that this is what we should be doing rather than just shouting at each other and going, the government doesn't listen to us. Well, let's actually do something about it. Having a sandbox is a nice community where it's not just people that are building, it's the corporates, it's industry, it is the government as well. Um, and it's really interesting and we're glad to uh, be able to, you know, we'll be able to show some more things coming out of that soon. Another real world use case and my embarrassing face there, um, Crypto Lulu, these NFTs. What this is all about is a restaurant in a prominent place in Sydney that faces the Opera House, that faces Darling Harbour, and they had just refurbished their bar. They wanted to turn it into a Soho house uh, out of London, like an exclusive lounge kind of bar. How they did that was that they're interested in blockchain tech. They said, could we do NFTs with these kinds of perks? Sure. The problem they had was that if you just had the NFT and someone at the restaurant you know, they need to, sh you need to see your ticket. The restaurant people, they're not necessarily into NFTs. How are they gonna know if someone's just showing them a right click save or is, you know, actually legitimately the owner and you're opening up your MetaMask? They're not gonna know that. So what we had to do was actually put the NFT design, uh, put a QR code over the top. So you buy it on OpenSea, the QR code over the top, um, there is a registration page where you get put into the uh, the, the customer kind of system that they've got there. When you go to the restaurant, you scan your NFT, the restaurant managers or whoever it is at the, the bar, they can see your registration details. So by doing that, you're crossing over and having a bit of a Web 2 mixed with Web 3. Um, imagining and extrapolating that because this came out, now we're talking to other membership places, whether it's sporting clubs or whether it's other restaurants and bars, 
instead of like uh, using tickets, they'll, they'll have these NFTs and just QR code scan. And it's an easy process for those that are used to Web2, but there is that Web3 element. And what it means as well is that because this is a soft onboarding, as they do other things in business that are going to be to do with blockchain, people have already tried it out. If you haven't bought an NFT, um, it's not that daunting an experience. And so there's going to be a whole lot more uh, coming out of there and these activation events. I expect to see more corporates getting into the space or restaurants and bars. Final one I wanted to show you, and then we'll do some uh, you know, question time and stuff. Something that was really interesting and was highlighted by Chainalysis. Hands up here if you've heard of Chainalysis. A few of you have. You might know the crypto crime report. So um, we've had their chief data scientist from Washington, Yakov, uh, come down. And he highlighted that crypto, like BTC and ETH, were interestingly trading more in line with the S&P 500, the famous um, equities index, because crypto was supposed to be this hedge. It's not supposed to be in line with equities. But after a while, it was getting in line. Reason being is that people are seeing crypto and blockchain as emerging technology, and they're seeing it as the new wave of innovation that's coming along. So we can see here, this is like one of the pages of a app that we built. This is free, I'll share the link later, but on one of the pages you see here, this is a page that shows some common uh, and well-known technology companies. Taiwan Semiconductor, it's in your phones. Peloton, it's maybe you've got one at home. Roku, that's more a US one, Asana, GitLab, if you're a developer here, you will probably be using GitLab. Salesforce, you can see even with Salesforce that up until a certain point in time, it wasn't really correlated, it got more strongly correlated more recently. We also look at Aussie ones as well, so Aussie tech. Wise tech, for example, which was correlated and suddenly like broke off. Zero, computer share, technology one, kind of was strong and it's broken off. Next DC as well, Block, Jack Dorsey. Um, they're listed here, even though it's an American company, they're in the payment space. I don't know why, it's correlation, not causation here, folks, but I don't know why, but it is 95% correlated with Ethereum for some reason. It's just really interesting to see this kind of stuff when people go, oh, crypto is on its own. No, crypto is innovation, crypto is the next wave of technology, and we're seeing it really play out in the price charts anyway. And um, here's a really interesting example. Do you guys know Berkshire Hathaway? Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, those guys, yeah, cool old dudes with a lot of money. Um, they hate crypto, right? Absolutely hate it. What's really interesting is that Ethereum is, or Berkshire Hathaway, I should say, Berkshire Hathaway, the, the, the stock, whether it's the A shares or the B shares, because they're listed twice, is 80% correlated with Ethereum. So how can you hate something if your share price is trading in line with uh, the same thing that you, you love? So anyways, um, to see Crypto Tracker, and we've got um, the correlation analysis is what's working right now. So I scrape a whole heap of stuff. I've got interns that have helped me out. I've done some of this as well. We're not doing the market comparisons or this is the advanced and new stuff. That's going to be coming soon, but this is just a free app for the community. Um, I've got a portfolio of different like analytics apps. I used to do a lot of stuff in ETFs, but I've got crypto. I'm in this space. I need to build something there. So tiny URL, just a URL shortener, cryptocurrency tracker. Check it out. Um, it's on uh, various websites. I put it in the Oz DeFi newsletter as well. Uh, and other announcements, uh, not too much. Uh, token mapping consultation paper. This is what I've spent the last two weeks trying to sort out. Whole heap of people have given their responses from the community, and it was my job to read through that and find the commonalities by using something called ChatGPT. Um, so ChatGPT was great at pointing out what was common, but still you can't just trust the output. You actually have to read it yourself and see if it makes sense. But it still saved me a lot of time instead of doing it from scratch. So I put in, here's response one to this question, response two, three, four, five, find the commonalities and common themes, find the differences. You still have to read it. Does it make sense? Is this in line with our views? There's differing views. That The output of this was that most people that submitted want some sort of clarity around regulation, no matter what space they were in. But we differed on how we actually want to see regulation in force and that's fine. I'm presenting that to Treasury. Um, they had us up there talking at a round table to give our views on the community. Now we actually get to present it. We're very lucky to be close with them because this is two weeks late. Um, so we got an extension, so we're okay. Uh, by midnight tonight, so if you see me on the floor, wake me up because I need to submit it. Um, so that's one. 
Now, ah, hey, look how fast it is, because we're in Web3, Samira's here. Um, Web3 Innovation Center. In Sydney, you see the smaller photos, because I've taken photos at the bottom there with Sterling and Rose, who are a law firm that building smart legal contracts as a technology platform. Very, very cool and interesting. Um, you've got some builders at the top right there, Tristan, and then you've got Sam, who's building a metaverse education thing. Um, the guy with the goatee, you can forget about him. Uh, it's no, my colleague Arturo, shout out to Arturo, who could make it down. Um, he goes by numbers on uh, Discord and Twitter, and when you see him typing, be scared. Uh, Katarina is awesome as well, and she's doing some things in marketing. But really cool here, on the right of me, and my face is there, I know, we can Photoshop that up. Uh, ben Simpson from Collective Ship. Hands up if you have heard of Collective Ship, the research platform. Yep, so they're here in Melbourne in Zone Talk. And then Samira, who's working on Elbay, another awesome platform. And you can talk to her to learn more about that. But if people want to work together in this space, or you're just a single founder and you want to be amongst the crowd and have those water cool conversations, join us at the Web3 Innovation Center with Zone Talk and we can talk about that. Finally, OzDefi has a set of NFTs or the OzDefi NFT heroes. What do you get from that? You get certain perks, you get an OzDefi hoodie, you get a consultation with one of the different affiliated groups, whether it's for marketing or whether it's for development. Um, and if other people are here and want to be part of that, please let me know, we can put your groups there. There's a token gated section to the Discord where you get early announcements about these events so before they sell out, well, I mean, this is free, so it's not really selling out. Um, but before they are gone, you get to hear the announcements and um, th there's going to be some other things that we'll be doing there. Okay, so that one and then uh, the QR code. So if there's any questions here, we'll bring our speakers back up. But do we have questions? Questions, questions? People came to drink. Oh, yes, 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 one second. There's one more question. Um, it's for uh, our legal advice that's binding. <laughs> Um, here's a quick question. Um, I've always been confused with if you register a trademark in Australia, how powerful is that uh, on a global scale? Yeah, good question. Um, so if you register a trademark in Australia, that is, to, that can be enforced in Australia. So we have what's called a Madrid Protocol system, where if you want to register your trademarks internationally, um, there's a system to do that, and you can pick the countries in which it's enforced. Um, so you, you can't really, if you don't have a presence in the US, for example, try to enforce your trademark in Australia in the US, um, because they're different markets, um, and it's a different system. So um, short answer to that is, it's powerful in Australia, yes, but if you are looking to enforce your rights internationally, then We'll have to register them in the countries that you wish to operate in. Okay, so how it, like it's, there's whatever, 197 sovereign nations or whatever. How expensive does it get if you play them? Or do you just pick and choose? Uh, like, because something like an NFT, that's a global market. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, you can pick and choose. So say if you know that you're only going to be operating in Australia, the US, and Canada, you can just register your trademarks in those systems and there's set prices. Um, I can't think of them at the top of my head. But I know that if you have a global portfolio, there's also kind of a way to manage the costs for that. Um, but perhaps we can talk more in detail. Okay, thanks. Never trust me. No, great. A absolutely awesome question there. Uh, yeah, I'll grab the mic. Um, you know, one of the things that I had heard. Uh, sorry, I like to talk a lot. Um, one of the things that I had heard in the space getting started was that we can't regulate DeFi. It's just not going to happen, so it might as well all be just like on chain and we, we shouldn't have regulations because how are different governments, 179 sovereign nations, all going to agree to the one type of regulation? I feel like we're going to get to a point where we're going to have regulation type things. Australia will have its own regulation, we'll have regulation in the US and Japan, etc. And we'll have tokens that imbue parts of the, like it, it enforces certain rules in the token. So we talked about Silvergate and all that kind of stuff. Now imagine that you've got a token where you're not supposed to sell that to retail because that's the rules in the financial services here in Australia. Right now, if you're not supposed to sell something to retail, you're just not supposed to do it. And then if you do something wrong, you get fined by ASIC, etc. 
Well, with smart contracts, we could have something where unless you're whitelisted, you're just not going to be able to get that token sold to you. So it's not just like rules that you have to follow. It's just rules that you just can't do anything with. So having a system like that where you've got tokens that imbue those rules, if it needs to be transferred to Canada, for example, out of Australia, you could burn the NFT or the token here and um, mint the same one that has Canada's regulatory rules over there as an idea. Obviously, it's not the be all and end all, but using blockchain to think about how we can actually do cross-border transactions with rules in it is really interesting. Do we have some other questions, folks? Was everyone keen on networking? Sounds like keen on drinking to me, but uh, I wanted to thank you all and, and food, food for two. Um, thank you for all for coming down. We're going to have more of these each month. Um, and if anyone's got any feedback or questions, please uh, come and, and network. But thank you, Sensan. Thank you, Firebox. Thank you for all our speakers and sponsors. I'm Mark. I'll, I'll talk to you guys soon.